Let's go ahead and bring in Steiner Sports CEO, Brandon Steiner. One of the country's top memorabilia mogul. I have an unbelievable guest, Brandon Steiner. Brandon is second to none. I need no introduction. I know you're probably sick of me today because we've had a, just a day full of excitement here. Um, but my boy, my brother, fellow Orangeman, John Wallace. So much to talk about, so little time, John. Well, thank you. Always good Thanks to see coming. you, Stein. Always good to see you, my brother. Dude, I got to be honest with you. I mean, you went to school 92 to 96, right? You just told me? Yeah. I mean, you're wearing a lot of Syracuse stuff right now. You're, you're I mean, is there anybody more Syracuse orange than you? No. That's been confirmed it's just like a de- years ago. Does the school still wardrobe you? You know, you don't play there anymore. Yeah, Swirls takes care of me. Um, Coach Beheim takes care of me. It's unbelievable. Um, you look like you still play. Well, you I, probably I, could. I, I, I can play. I, I just don't, um, you know, I try to stay in enough shape to, you know, beat up on my two oldest sons. And uh, nice. so that's my that's my sole motivating factor to stay in shape. Now your son's still balling? Yeah, my uh, my oldest son's actually coaching up in Rochester. Um, he has his own AU program, New York Ballers. We'll be actually playing in the um, – junior NBA tournament, the first tournament they're doing this year, like the Little League World Series. And um, my middle son is playing at Southern Connecticut with uh, where Scotty Burrell is the head coach. And he's a, he's a junior. Well, he's a redshirt junior. Can you enjoy he enjoying this? He redshirted this year. He uh, dislocated his elbow. I'm, I'm, man, I'll tell you what, Stein, I'm blessed. Kids are good. Work is good. Business is good. I'm a very blessed man. I agree. I agree. I, I just got to tell you, man, you walk in, you just get me all orange. You get me all orange-centric. Quick. Talk to me. I got to jump in. There's so many things I want to talk to you about besides the state of the NCAA, what just happened with uh, one of the Syracuse players going to the G League, what you're feeling about. Well, let's just get to that. Okay. What you're feeling, I mean, should I, high school players be going right to the G League and then skip the one-and-done thing? Well, I think – you should have the option to go right to the NBA um, right from high school because no other sport do they, besides football, which is understandable because it's such a, you know, highly impact, you know, collision sport. But with with basketball and, and the whole one and done, it's, it's been like kind of made a mockery of because, I mean, yeah, they go there and they have to get grades for like the first semester, right? And then by the time second semester grades come around, if – you know, they're not going to school. Gone. They don't care, but they're gone. Um, you know, they're, with 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 Baisley, of course I wanted him to come to Syracuse. But as, as a as a man, he, he's pursuing his dream, and he, he thinks that gets him there a step, a, a, a year more prepared to play against grown men. Then I, I can I can respect that. Hopefully it works out for him because you don't want it to backfire. Fire because what people don't realize is, in the G League, ninety to ninety five percent of those guys aren't NBA players. So if you don't play good, it looks really bad. That's why when you see a guy averaging eighteen, nineteen points a game in the G League, it's not really a big deal. You have to average thirty a game, thirty five. Because, like Trey Burke was dropping thirty, yeah. and and but and basically saying, oh, maybe let me maybe not maybe play the rest of this game." You could see he was a man amongst boys. Exactly. He dropped the thirty when he decided to drop the thirty. At least I thought. I'm a big G League fan, and I like the league. I love the G League. I, I feel like the league is on its way finally. If you have a few more two way players on there, mm-hmm. you, got, you you got something that's really worth watching. What I don't understand is why don't the local teams recruit local players. Like, why wouldn't Westchester Knicks have more Syracuse players? Why wouldn't the Chicago team have more Michigan and and Ohio State players? Things like that. Well, because certain Syracuse players that would possibly come here have better fits in other programs. It's not about the fit. It's about the attendance and about the marketing. Well, it's all about the fit, right? (laughs) Yeah, it is about the fit. You're right. Because you got to go to a place where you could possibly make the team um, where a team has a need for what you do well. That's that's the whole thing in the G League. Most of those guys will never get called up, but the, the slim chance of you getting called up is because whatever you do very well, that team that uh, that owns your rights is lacking. That's how you get called up. Talk to me about your level of competition. I hear stories about you. I mean, because you seem such a nice, laid-back, teddy bear kind of guy, and it's been a while since you were competing like that. But 
Are they true? Were you a, as fierce a competitor as, as as the stories that are told about you? Absolutely. I I I loved I loved winning since I can remember competing in anything in my life. I remember trying to cheat my mom playing cards when I was six years old. So I've always <laughs> had a disdain for losing. Like I just, you know. So yeah, the the stories are true. Especially the one with me and Hopkins getting left behind one time because we were playing. Well, take me to that story. Game. You and Hopkins are at the airport. Yep, we're playing video game, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> coach already told us like, "Come on, let's go." And I'm like, "Hop won, and then I won." So neither one of us won. You're playing game. a video game yeah. in the airport. Street Street Fighters. Street Fighters. And I was Blanca. I always used Blanca, and and Hop would rotate through different people because I was always, I was I used to own that game. <laughs> and on uh, this particular day, Hop was getting the better of me. And so it just couldn't end that way. So we, we ended up buying like $30 worth of we, – we ended up getting like $30 worth of quarters. And we just played and played and played. We didn't realize the bus left us, honestly, when we got done. <laughs> the bus was left. The bus left. Well, Bam's like, we're leaving at six. We're leaving at six. <laughs> There's not a lot of flexibility to his timing. He, yeah. He's a pretty flexible guy, but not on the timing. Yeah, and uh, but you know that's just a crazy story. Uh, Hop and I still. Who was telling the story about Hop? Did Hop call you once and say, "Would you come down and let me play defense on you?" Oh yeah. Well, what was that about? What was that? Well, so Hop. Talking Mike get- Hopkins, former assistant coach now. Coach of University of Washington basketball. Lo- love Mike Hopkins. You can't not love Mike I Hopkins. I love Hop. I played right? with Hop. Um, so so Hop calls you up one day. My sophomore, Going into my sophomore year that summer, so Hop had graduated, and he was getting ready for the NBA. And he was just – the only way he was going to make the NBA was <clears throat> defense, right? And I was probably – myself and Lawrence Moe were the most offensive guys. There's no question. Poetry in motion, baby. But he wanted to guard a, a bigger guy. So he, he, I used to literally go and play hop one-on-one, three, four hours on offense only. So I, I loved him for that because – Who I mean, does this? Who goes and plays one-on-one and only wants to play defense? And one, one, one day in particular, I was on fire. And I remember we were sitting there, and he goes, there's probably no shot I'm going to make the NBA because you're a sophomore in high school and you're just kicking my – <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Why Syracuse, by the way? How do you end up at Syracuse? I mean, I'm from probably, Rochester. You could have gone to a bunch of places or no? Uh, yeah, I could have went anywhere in the country. Uh, you know, but I told Georgetown, North Carolina, Indiana, don't even bother recruiting me. Good, I'm good, not good. Those, that's good. I'm Georgetown not that type especially. Of player. Um, yeah, I could have went anywhere in the country, but I've always loved Syracuse uh, as a kid. My, my earliest tournament moments or memories are – you know, unfortunately, the 87 game. And then I remember in 91, we were the first 15 seed to lose to the two seed. I mean, two seed to lose to a uh, f- 15 seed. So I've always, always loved Syracuse. How always. do you lose to a 15 seed, though? It How happens. Something like that happen. Who'd you yeah. lose to? Uh, well, was that Syracuse. Vermont? Was that Vermont? Syracuse lost to Richmond. Oh, Richmond. Richmond Spiders. Richmond Spiders. They just came out. You didn't see them coming, or you were, were looking past them? Well, I wasn't on the team. Oh, I would have never allowed that. Let's get that clear. Okay. Uh, right. That's the one thing I joke with Billy and Derek about all the time because they ended their college. Billy lost to the Richmond Spiders his last game in college, and Derek lost to Minnesota. So you bring that up all the time. Yeah. It's no yeah, question. Yeah, little jabs at him a little bit. Yeah. I wouldn't have lost to Richmond or Minnesota. But, um, no, they lost them in 91, just like Coach K lost to Lehigh uh, with, with C.J. McCollum on the team. You know, he was a two seed. It happens. It's You know, it happened in Bennett this year with Virginia. It's tough. There's a, there's so much there, 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 there's a lot of parity in college basketball because of the one and done because you get a team full of freshmen and sophomores going against a team of mid majors of juniors and seniors that's going to be a 50 50 game majority of nights right I mean yeah the, the, I can see that even though the, the 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 talent discrepancy is heavily always favored in the one and dones talent. But you get some juniors and seniors who've been playing together in a cohesive unit. You're, they're a hard out. Chris, you're playing together two, three years, and God knows how much the pickup games. Kind of like the way the Warriors are. Exactly. They practice a lot. All together. on the same page. Yeah. You just know where each other. You know, you just know where each other is going to be. What's up with Banheim? What, what, I mean, I, I sit behind the bench. I, I love him as a bench coach, by the way. I, obviously, I, I, I love him as a coach in general, but. 
funny guy in the huddle, um, or could be funny, could be very. He's, he's one of the guys who's hilarious, and he's not even trying to be. <laughs> and that's just, you know, he says some of the craziest things that, that are just hilarious. And, um, you know, my I think his biggest attribute to me as a coach is the way he makes you feel as a player confident-wise. I mean, he he fills you with premium on let it. And How he, so? Take me through that. You know, that's just, important. I mean, confidence and well, self-esteem. He he ins, he instills a lot of confidence in you because he he put he 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 requires you to or or allows you to do like whatever your game is capable of doing. He no restrictions as long as it's not detrimental to the team. So, for me, my progression going from freshman year all the way to senior year. Freshman year, I probably took one or two threes. Sophomore year, I think seven or eight. Junior year, a couple. And senior year, I take I take like ninety threes, and, and it's just it's just a progression of him instilling me with the confidence to to take those shots because Beheim has never said to me that's a bad shot. He always says next time hold your follow through or balance get get better balance or take your time. He would never say that's a bad shot, or so he just he just makes you feel like even though you miss, like I, I should have made that next time. I will make it because I'm going to do all the things coach just said I should have done. Surprise you how long this guy is able to keep going. He's like the ever ready bunny, and he looks good. He loves it. I mean, uh, his kids. I, you know, I I have five kids, and I think kids keep you young. He's got he's got young kids. His son Buddy's getting ready to come to uh, go to uh, Syracuse. His his uh his youngest daughter is playing ball yeah. going to U of R I think or R I T. Um, she can ball. Yeah, and his She's son Jimmy's at Cornell. Cornell. So I mean, it keeps yeah. you young, man. Your kids are yeah. in college. He loves basketball, and then we're we're grateful that you know he's he's still a part of a Syracuse yeah. uh, basketball. Special. You talk about when you go and speak to kids in your program. Tell me a little bit about that program and, and how real do you get? Because I just don't see a filter with you. No, no filter. I mean, so how does that go now when you go and speak to all these kids? Because you've, you're you pretty committed to this. I, I've been doing it for eight or nine years now, uh, part of the winning because I tried. Um, also doing stuff in uh, out, out of Ardsley with Heavenly Productions, going to uh, taking backpacks and teddy bears to – uh, impoverished schools and um, going to talk to them and trying to just uplift their spirits for that day and uh, hopefully something leaving them with something that can help them in the future. Talking to kids like, like I was saying off off the uh, off air, I tell the I, I go into the schools and I tell the principal and the teachers, you know, basically you might not like what I'm gonna say because it's not all favorable towards you in the school. You know, I, I talk to kids, you know, about, like, getting back to the the vocational trades and all that sometimes. Like, because math, English, science, social studies isn't for everyone. doesn't mean you can't be successful. It but doesn't it's mean just, you're not smart. Exactly. Exactly. Thank it, but God, it, because I would have been considered a complete <laughs> idiot. I, I mean, in all fairness, I mean, some of those subject matters I just loved and some I just struggled. Myself oh. included. Like, I love math and all that, but... Yeah. When it when it came to English, I just I, I had no desire to read a what do you tell four hundred page book, and I, I tell them to you know obviously you got to do the work to get the grade right. So you gotta you gotta learn to a be have have a great rapport with your teacher. Don't be that kid that I'm too cool to talk to the teacher, because I I was always talking to the teacher, because if if you're ever on that fence, they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt because you seem like you care. You seem so. Talk to the teacher. B, do your work. Like just just do the work. Like you don't have to go and study a hundred hours a week, but do the work. It's not hard. We're all smart enough to do the work. So do the work. And if you need help, or you know, ask, make sure you ask that teacher that, for extra help. And doing nothing isn't an option, though. Act, exactly, and that's the problem because when kids check out. Now it's like, all right, how do you get them back interested in school because they don't like that class they're in? So back when we went to school, and I, I say we because, you know, we, even though we're a different genera- you know, generation or whatever, same things are going on in school. Yeah. Kids left school during the day sometime to go to learn a trade, right? So I told kids, 
if you're not good at math, science, or one of those subjects, try to get into some vocational or, or you know, some trade schools so you can be self-reliant. That's the most important thing because if you're not self-reliant, if you're always heavily relying upon other people to take care of you and put money in your pocket, that's when the problem comes. Because at some point when you don't have money or you don't have the recent, you know, the means that, you know, to eat or take care of yourself, you, people will go out, of, go out of character and do anything. You know, right that's anyone, that. yeah. anywhere in the world. Yeah. You, you, you get hungry, you will go out of character. You know, right. so you try to make sure the kids, you know, they frown upon certain job. And I'm like, if, if you do the math and a, a guy goes and does like a five or eight year bid in jail, right? But that same guy would never, ever work at McDonald's. But he goes to jail and he's, now he's working for 17 cents a day, oh. right? Or whatever they pay him. It's some, you know, menial payments. Then... You, you, you do the math of the minimum wage now times, you know, 30, 40 hours a week at a McDonald's over eight years. It's a lot of money. Yeah. You yeah. know, that's yeah. how you got to start. That's So that's how you get the kids to think in long term. And, and, and usually will lead to something else. But that's yeah. how you, you just yeah. get them thinking long term about, yeah. you know, basically, you know, being able to take care of yourself because that's, that's the root. That's at the root of the problem because if you can't take care of yourself you, and you – People are taking care of you constantly, and those people aren't doing it happily. Something happens bad. Nothing <laughs> good. What's your take? By the way, I got a little gift for you, by the way. You know, a little piece of the 2003 championship court. Somebody, okay. You know, it's like kind of a good luck charm. Away. So I just kind of just look. Thanks so much. I appreciate so that. Something I have just to remind it, you know, just winning. Talk to me about the NBA. What's your take on the NBA now? Do you like the league? And. And, you know, what's your general feeling? I mean, the Knicks are struggling. There's a lot of teams struggling and how they get out of that struggle. Well, are some of the teams struggling on purpose? <laughs> There's no question. I'm trying to get the lottery pick. But, I mean, I'm talking about teams that, that when I, oh, people complain about the Knicks to me, for example. And I'm like, listen, you know something? There's a commitment from Mass Square Garden to do everything and anything possible to win. It's not from a lack of trying. See, but, but, but I wouldn't trade the Nick team in for 12 other teams. I wouldn't want to be Charlotte. I wouldn't want to be Sacramento. I wouldn't want to be a whole bunch of these other teams. Well, I'm so happy you said that, you know, about the Knicks trying because more people, so many people in the streets I have to correct who yeah. try to bash the Knicks yeah. and management and – they, Mr. They, kill, Dolan. they kill themselves on all courses to try to win. And I just I, think it's incredibly difficult. Uh, it, it's it's really it's hard. It's incredibly difficult. But don't don't fault the guy, Mr. Dolan, who's he, he's cut every check that has been asked of him. Oh, and then some. Yeah. I and, mean and his his ROI no, I, right I, now is like not good. Yeah, but you know that's so that's and, what makes and, you, and, and that sometimes happens, but his ROI when he made a billion dollar investment in ninety four. No, I'm talking about on the players right no, now. I'm just saying the guy's made a lot of incredibly oh, good decisions. Of course, decisions, of course. But, but that's I think, why he's a billionaire. But I think winning though in the NBA it's hard. Is, is it too difficult? It's almost it's hard. too hard. And, and 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 things have to align right. You have to you know, like like Donovan Mitchell, for instance. Like Jeez. you know, no one knew he was going to be that good. I saw Donovan in Utah, by the way. I said, dude, man. He's great. He's, um, he's really a good. He's personality. A lot, a lot of teams pass on him, though, right? I mean, so, like, sometimes you, you hope to find that diamond in the rough, and hopefully the Knicks can find another one because I think that's what Chris Stops was, even though he went that high. A lot of people weren't high on him. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I, I, you know. We got another one coming. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to be all right, you know. Um I think Scott, you know, not I think Scott Perry and and Steve Mills are going to make the, all the right moves, and they're going to get us back in a position to contend and compete for titles. Burke could be a sleeper. Yeah, and, I, and you know what? He's not really a sleeper. He's a lottery pick, but he's rebounded. Burke, Burke he 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 he's to be commended. He be, fell because he fell. He was a bust. He was in the G League for a while. He was shipped from team to team. And it's easy to lose your confidence in your way in, in, in those predicaments. And for him to come out on the other side looking even better is a testament to his character. Surprise, man, because it, I watched him. And that's a Michigan. Scott Perry fine. So that's that's a, that's, fine. That was a, that was I just a Scott think it's Perry fine. so hard in the NBA to win. There's more teams that don't win than that do. Yeah. And I, I'd love to see Adam Silver help figure that out. 
Well, then. I think the G League is a part of it, maybe. Develop more players so there's more more good players to be had, maybe. Well, as, as long as you have three or four type all-stars on one team, it's going to be tough because everyone's now trying to get three or four all-stars, and I, the, the truth of the matter is only one or two teams are going to have that. You know you'd be on Golden State right now if you were still playing. No, or would you want to have I, your own I thing? I always went against the grain. Not, like, not that I was an all-star or anything like that, but – I always went against the grain. I always did my own thing. Um, plus, you know, from the cloth we're cut from, coming, you know, watching the 80s basketball and then playing in the NBA in the 90s, we weren't about joining forces. We were about breaking through on our own. So it was, it was a completely different mindset. We didn't have that mindset at all. Your favorite moment as a pro? Favorite moment as a pro is just probably, you know, hearing my name getting called by David Stern because, you know, it was, it was, I was never, I never really thought about the NBA as a kid. I wasn't that kid who played basketball young. I was, I, I boxed and I played football. Um, so basketball kind of came, uh, you know, yeah. late for me. I was a late bloomer. So, you know, but the, to stand there and realize all those hours, you know, the, the whole 10,000 hours, you know, I was doing that before the Outliers book was out. I love like, the Outliers yeah. book. Uh, for those but, that, that Malcolm Gladwell talks about you put 10,000 hours in before the end of your high school, there's a good chance you could be extraordinary at something. You feel like you did that. I, I know I did. I know I did because I was a 10 hours every day kid, even if it meant Me missing too. school. It didn't help my basketball game, by the way, but <laughs> thank God my mother stopped me. You know, she's like, you know, I was playing basketball like eight, ten hours a day. See, that's that was me. And, and she's like, you're going to have to diversify because there's no way you're going to the NBA. <laughs> you're too short. You're white Jewish. If you can find me a white Jewish kid in the NBA that's 5'7", then I'll let you keep playing. If not, you're going to have to do something else too. I said, Mom, I think I can make it to the NBA. I'm going to keep working. She's like, I don't think so. But you show you, I would, you know. I really thought that every day I, I went to sleep with a ball. I slept with my ball every yeah, night. You know. uh, I went to sleep shooting. I used to play this game, like trying to work on my touch, trying to get the shadow of the ball on the ceiling without touching the ceiling. Really? So you go, you know, you have a contest, your right hand versus your left hand. And it helps with your dexterity, your touch around the rim. You have great footwork around the rim. Where did you get that from? Um, Coaches. Uh, coach, My coach, uh, Damon. Uh, Mr. Dames, my uh, JV coach, was a great coach. Uh, man, he was, and, and, and Coach Don Brown and my coach, Doug, Mr. Doug Childs up in Rochester. They, those guys were all about fundamentals. I was I was a master of the McHale moves, Jack Sigma moves. Yeah, yeah. You know, those guys were just so efficient in the post, so I picked up on all those Jack things. Jack Sigma? You throwing Jack Sigma around? You, well, you remember his footwork? Unbelievable. Footwork was incredible. The inside pivot. He was a little bit of a slow white guy. Yeah, but the inside pivot with couldn't the pump stop fake. Him. Yeah, and stop then him. if First you could one. shoot a little bit, they have to go for it. I think that the pump fake is so underrated and the crossover. Like if I was starting over again, you'd uh, work on that more. I'd be just like working on my crossover and working on my pump fake. Okay. I, would, I mean, people don't go to that enough. You see it a lot now in high school. Yeah. You know, the pump fake, but the crossover is old school, like Pearl. Yeah. Who? I mean, a shimmy. The shimmy cross. Oh man. I miss Pearl. Pearl. The best. Miss Pearl. I mean, nobody did a shimmy. No one had it like and Pearl. And that crossover, you break your ankle. Pearl. So I love that commercial. Pearl. The guys, like, the guys talk about all the ankles. Two weeks later. <laughs> two weeks later, be break, falling down. <laughs> hey, what's on your pod? What, what music are you listening to? I'm always listening to old school hip hop. Nas, Biggie, Jay Z. I don't. I don't really. Uh, differentiate from. Uh, I mean, You're I. None of the new stuff. No. At all. You're an old school music Not too guy. Much. Yeah, because I, you know, I like I like the real essence of hip hop. Any, any good movies you're watching? Anything new? Uh, any new movies you've seen lately, or anything? What's your What's ne your favorite movie Netflix of all time? Right now, what's your favorite movie of all time? First of all, what's your favorite fave movie you love? A go to movie? Uh, Are you a romantic guy or comedy uh, it's guy? It's a couple. Uh, there, there's there's Scarface. Say there, hello to my little there's, friend. There's Friday. Yeah. Um. Oh man, Minutes of Society I love, you know. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yep. How about um TV shows? What are you watching these days? A lot of good TV, man. Unusual Suspects. Really? TV shows uh uh I like Blackish. It's really really funny, I think. Hysterical. Yeah. Uh I'm 
the Carmichael show went off. I, I really like that. You a um, Shameless guy? I watch Shameless a little bit. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> or Ray yep. Donovan. Showtime. Yeah, I like Showtime. I watch Ray Donovan. Designated yeah. Survivor. He's done a nice job, Keith Sutherland. I, I've never seen that. Yeah, that's, he's done a nice job with that show, seen. actually. Really. Not, okay. not bad. He's done a nice show. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I've never. I have to check that out. Are you a little upset about what happened? Like they're knocking down some of the old bars at Syracuse over Marshall Street? Absolutely. It's, it's a little bit discouraging. I can't believe I could, it. I didn't even invest in that. I was a little like, oh, man. Things have changed, huh? It's it's sad when they start taking down, you know, like cornerstones of Syracuse party lore, you know, and they're putting condos, like, or apartments, whatever. I mean, the whole – Thing of Marshall Street is you go there to have a good time, right? We all did, and then you leave and go home. No one wants. No one wants to drive. Have to go far. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. Hopefully, it doesn't get, you know. I like to see him reset Marshall Street for all the Syracuse fans out there, um, Syracuse Nation. I mean, is there a better school with a stronger following? I mean, the only other school I can see that's in the same no, no, no. breath. I'm going to cut you off. All right. There's okay. no school in the same breath as Syracuse. Not possible. Not possible. Which it's makes you constantly fashionable. It's, a, it's, a, it's the greatest four years imaginable in, in your lifetime. Uh, gr- greatest entrepreneurs out of Syracuse. Um, we're, I'm sitting next to one of them. Well, thank you. Um, you know, and I, I'm not just saying that because he's here. You know, the, the Syracuse contingency in New York City is very strong. Uh, guys, I lean on for business advice. As you know, I've, I've I'll call on you at any time for anything. A mother, you know, Hal Fetner the same way. Yep. Stuart Morris, all all my Syracuse guys, they, they they just always have showed me a tremendous amount of love, and not just because of basketball, because I've I've had to earn my business stripes, you know, and that's when you go into business and you fill yourself with some humility and knowing that you're a novice, then you might be able to learn something from guys. And I always went into every meeting and every situation with that mindset. Humility, knowing that I'm not, uh, I'm a novice in this game and I want to learn from you. Syracuse Nation is so strong. Ben, how's our following today? We got a lot of, we, we have a big Syracuse following usually. Um, How's it following? <laughs> How about the 44 ritual, though? I see you wearing the hat. Uh, anybody out there has got a feeling about the 44? I mean, there's nothing like 44 well, about Syracuse. What's well, do feeling? you know what the 44, why Jim Brown wore 44? No. A lot of people don't know the story. And I didn't get this story from Jim Brown himself, but I got it from someone who Jim Brown told the story okay. to. Well, the legend has it that because of all the problems back then in those times, even though he was like a scholarship type player, he 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 wasn't going to be allowed to go go to Syracuse without the help of some donations. So legend has it that 44 people donated for Jim Brown to go to Syracuse. And that's why he wore the number 44. And I'm honored and beyond ecstatic and elated to be the last person that, to, that, that has worn that number on the basketball court. What prompted you to wear 44, though? I wore, it in, I, wore it in, I wore it in eighth grade. I wore it in, you know, my first year of basketball was eighth grade. I wore the number. Um, I always wore it, you know, and, and because of Derek Coleman, you know, because – you know, that was my guy coming up, watching him play. So I've always uh, – What was Derek? I mean, you know, listen, I've gotten to know Derek, and, and he's just a completely different person when you get to know him versus what you think. Yeah, absolutely. Right? What, what, what's, what's your take on Derek? I mean, do people realize how good he Derek, was? Derek has his facade, and if you aren't able to break through it, then you're only able to see that hard facade that he puts on. But guys like us, real Syracuse guys, guys he knows that really has love for him, you're able to break through that facade and you're able to see the real him and you're able to see uh, a loyal, tremendous friend. And uh, we, we did a, myself, Lawrence Moten, Etan Thomas, Billy Owens, Derek Home. we did a fatherhood panel up in Syracuse a couple years back and it was the only time I've ever seen, I saw Derek was crying about, 
you know, sharing his story about, you know, not knowing who his father was. And it was, you know, that's the Derek I know because I, I see that side of him all the time. Not the crying side because I've never seen him cry, which almost made me cry because I was like, you know, that that was deep. But um, just to see the real side of, you know, because Derek puts on this, ah, bravado all the time. And Big. Yeah. But, you maybe, know. Maybe the greatest Syracuse basketball player that ever played? I'd say Dave Bing. Uh, because Dave Bing is in the NBA Hall of Fame. Dave Bing averaged like 28 a game. Uh, in the three seasons, the things that Dave Bing, his career average is the highest ever at Syracuse. So, Give I me was, your starting five for Syracuse. If you're going to pick off from – give me your starting five, and I'll give you a third guard, and I'll give you a third forward. All right, point guard. At least you know who the coach is going to be. At least we got that squared away. Point guard Pearl, even though – Sherm is a close second, you know. But okay, I'll let you use him as a third guard. The general was unbelievable. At the, at the two, do you, do you give Sherm the inventing of the alley oop, though. Oh yeah, that I was mean, him all day. Oh my god! I mean, from like three quarter court and a perfect pass every time. He can alley oop from three quarter court. You could barely be able to dunk, and you'd still be able to dunk his pass because they were so perfect. Um, so Sherm, uh, Pearl at the point, Dave being at the two. Okay. Um. The three spot is the toughest spot because you can either go Billy Owens, Lawrence Moten, Raphael Addison, Wendell Alexis. Going I mean, old school. Because, well, Syracuse is forward. Pardon yeah. me. Syracuse is forward you. We have so many forwards that have come out of Syracuse and played in the NBA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. we're like forward you. So you could pick your poison. I'd probably, you know, Billy had a better – all around career, um, you know, so it's hard to go against Billy at the three, myself at the four, and Derek at the five. And I think that five man team would beat pretty much any five man team you could put together. That's just the way I feel, you know. I, I, I mean, that's a really strong, strong team. It's a strong team. Yeah, it's a strong team. Wow. Hopefully, you know, like we were talking about earlier with the whole you maybe put Melo in game. there. I mean, I'm just just saying. I mean, you got to throw well, Melo in there. I mean, is well, he, well, I, as a on the three, the, it's, it's hard to throw Melo in there over Billy. Yeah, um, only because know, maybe one year versus the because it's one year. Yeah. That's that's yeah. the only reason. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even though he won the national cha- championship and all that, and I, obviously I love Melo, you know, um, but you know. Yeah, I got Jerry Mack on the two is maybe the backup to being. At the two, Jerry? No, you put Lawrence Moten at the two. You move him over to the two. Yeah, you got to be. G Max got to be the point. Score, yeah. 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 I yeah. mean, we, we, we have a. There's a lot of players. Yeah, we have There's a, a plethora of, of guys who can fit the bill for us. Am I missing anything out there, Syracuse Nation? Bring it. Last thing. Do you hate UConn more than Georgetown or Georgetown more than UConn? What was the team you loved to beat? Was it Georgetown, UConn, in that order? And then was there a third team that I'm not thinking of? Well, I have this innate feeling about Georgetown, right? It's not a good one, I hope. So, (laughs) um, you know, you're born to hate Georgetown as a Syracuse. Was there a lot of talk, though, when you played Georgetown? No. Well, we owned them when I played. There's no rivalry really, because we always beat them. Ewing Ewing talks a lot. Ewing about wasn't how, there, right? Ewing talks a lot about how he owned, he, he owned us. Well, we owned them when I was there. Um, you know, only 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 losing. Uh, I think I was six and two. You don't think you know? Don't don't six me, and two? Yeah, yeah, while, six and two. While you know the Syracuse. scores you won there. You, everybody tries to. Yeah, well, I think we were. We like, lost. Two. We lost once. My. <laughs> Junior and once my senior year at, at, at you know at Georgetown, but um, the last game we ever played against Georgetown at twenty five and thirteen, we beat them by twenty. So you hold think, that Georgetown. You think? And uh, <laughs> so the whole UConn uh, battles were, were always really good. And, and crazy, crazily enough, when my son played against UConn two years ago, I ran into Jim Calhoun, and he was like, Wallace. You were like the one who got away. If you didn't end up coming to UConn, we'd have definitely won a title because I'd have been there with him, 
with uh, Donnie Marshall, Ray Allen, Deron Sheffer. So we didn't. But you know what I told him? I almost won one at Cuse. I'd rather almost win one at Houston than win one at UConn. Wow. And that's the truth. Wow. I'm a Cuse, baby. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm excited for next year. Oh, I can't wait. It's I can't be wait. be fun. be great. I'll see you up at the Q's for Men's Fantasy Basketball Camp. Are you, so you, are you, wait, li- Nation, the podcast, Steiner Nation. I'm leading. I'm leading towards going to Delta. Steiner hasn't, wife- hasn't come up to the fantasy camp in the last two years. He was Before that, he was a staple up there. Uh, he had he has a couple of championships. I guess he's just resting on his laurels. I have three, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three, three out of. I think you won three out of. I think you won three out of four. four. Uh, yeah, so yeah. like seventy five percent of the time you're there, you're winning chips, baby. It's my choice. It's only trophies <laughs> I've ever won in my whole life. Thank God, Jerry McNamara was my coach. A sleeper coach, by the way, I might add. I want to give Jerry Mack some props. Yeah. He was a good coach, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the yeah, fantasy yeah. camp is fun. It's a great yeah. time for yeah. all the former guys to come back, get together, and hang out. We do it every single year. It's always fun. It's always a good time. And uh, hopefully we look forward to seeing you up there this year, Steiner. Um, I may be on your team. I saw you guys are going to be playing with us. Well, you, Steiner, if you want to win, get on my team. I need Jerry Mack. He's, Jerry Mack's my first go-to. I'm always with Lawrence, though. We yeah. kind of like Lawrence and I have our thing. We, we have two championships. So, okay. Yeah. You must have won after I left. No, I don't know if you remember, but I won one. Oh, right, the one the last year I was there. We got yeah. the ass kicked. Yeah, that was terrible. Yep. Closing remarks, things you want to say, things you're up to, anything you want to promote? Uh, I'm, I'm not really promoting anything. I just I, – I, Other than a lot of Syracuse no, I just, I just apparel. Kind of, Hopefully I, you're working for Nike or whoever makes those 44 hats. I, I come here to support <laughs> my, my, my Syracuse brother anytime. Thank you. Um. You know, it's 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 amazing what you're doing with the podcast and the the traction you built. Because I remember when I did this show, wow, two or three years ago, we did a show with Pearl and yeah, Mike, we called them Mike Hoff. Yeah, yeah so. raised a lot of money for yep. Pearl, though. Yep. God rest his soul and everything. Yep. But it was a big help to him. Yeah. And and the, well, Beheim always talks about how Syracuse, as a city, as a Philanthropic city raises more money than all these other big blue blood cities, and that's a testament to the the type of people that are upstate in Syracuse Nation around the world. Like we just have big hearts and we're just real people, and, you know. And uh, you know, when I was at Syracuse and I was uh, hanging out with all my A Pi guys, I became like an honorary member of A Pi. And You're I would, an A pie guy. Yeah. I didn't so know I, that. I, would, I would go and like help them with the rush lines and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I, I'm with those guys all the time. We had a A pie reunion a uh, month and a half, two months ago in the city. That's cool. Dinner and everything. Good yeah. For you. Yeah. yeah. You're a flexible guy. Like you, I, I feel like you could. You fit gotta be. Right. I, I think it's survival of the flexible. Yeah. You're right. You got to be flexible. You got to have your head on a swivel. I can acclimate anywhere. I feel like you can acclimate yeah. anywhere. No yeah. question. I think it's a big strength of yours. Yeah, and and you know. Especially like when you're playing basketball, and I, you know, I went overseas. When you play overseas, you're you're like in a foreign country. <laughs> you, the language barrier. You don't know anyone like at all. You don't know anybody over there. There could be some cities that have nobody but white people. Well, that's where most of the cities are over there. There's you know? no black people. No, of any color, of no. any close to color. No, and they're just <laughs> some people look at you like you're like uh, a Martian. You know, like you know and. You, you could tell by their reaction, like they've never seen someone like you. And granted, I'm going back, you know, this is 2002, 2005 when I played overseas. So it's a long time yeah, ago, yeah. not recent. Yeah. But, I, I, you know, I was in Italy. I was in Greece. So the food was great. I had, you oh, had my time. God, the food was phenomenal. Really, really, really good food, except during what they call fiesta or whatever. Like during the day, from like noon to like three or eleven to like four, you can't eat. They just shut down. They take these long extended lunches, and you actually can look in the window and see people who are supposed to be cooking sitting there, smoking a cigarette, chilling. Like they don't stress themselves. They no, really low that. stress. Yeah, you know they don't work themselves to the bone. They'll rather say nine at uh, till nine at night than to work throughout the whole day and not take a four hour break. Cause that's what they do every day. You wonder if they're onto something. Well, they're well, they're onto something. Finland's onto something. I, I just saw some about Finland's uh, changing their whole schooling process. The what way are they they're, doing? So they're they're not they're 
they're, they're doing away with the traditional math, English, science way of teaching. Good. So like they're, that. they're yeah. So um, you know they're they're just they're just thinking outside the box. Love which that. In today's world, that. you have to. We need that. Right? In yeah, today's world, you have to think outside the box. You can't keep thinking, you know, the today's curriculum was kind of set in place in like the 1700s or something. You don't think anything's changed since God, the 1700s? God, some of those textbooks, man. <laughs> Algebra and calculus. <laughs> By the way, I, I, I just, you know, I got I to gotta add something to my Fab Five, uh, Roosevelt Bowie. Oh yeah, the big, he the original be, big man. He needs to be included in the conversation. Our first big man that you he, know, he, he would be the he would be the uh, the, the backup sitting yeah. behind Derek. Yeah, you which got, is yeah. no shame in that. I want to give him an honorable mention because you know. I, I, as a, well, as a I'm, guy, I'm happy you you uh, mentioned him because he's the he's the player that started the whole exodus to Syracuse. He was the original big time recruit to choose Syracuse. Over all the North Carolinas and all that, he was the first big. I'm recruit. a big Bowie fan. I love and him. And then yeah, Pearl was the first number yep. one player to yeah. sign with Syracuse. So those two guys are really, really influential in bringing other top-notch blue chip recruits to Syracuse. Myself being one of them. How great is Syracuse Nation? Anyway, we we killed you with Syracuse Nation today. Talk a little NBA. John, it's always great to have you here, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Good Stein. luck with your program over the summer. People want to get a hold of you. What's the best way? Uh, you, well, in, in, in t- pertaining to my winning because I tried, you just go to winning because I tried dot com. Um, ben, can you pop email. that in on? The, can you pop that? In? Ben's gonna pop that in. Winning, no spaces. Winning because I tried dot com. Um. Uh, other than that, I'm you know I'm very blessed and fortunate to be still working and collecting checks from the Knicks for the last eight years as an ambassador. Yep, community ambassador, service. community service. Uh, you know, people don't realize how much work the Knicks do on community well, service. It's insane. I don't want to bore you with this, but like I, that's another thing I get challenged about all the time. Like the whole incident that happened with Oakley and all that. And I'm not here to talk on that because they've already talked in court, settled it. But you can't paint a, uh, every uh, former Nick with the same broad paintbrush in terms of. And I get it. Oakley's definitely unhappy. But there's 15 other guys that are definitely happy. You know, being a part of the Knicks organization yeah. on a consistent basis. So you, you can't negate those 15 just because one person has a, a contentious yeah. type situation. So, and, and I don't think that should fall on any of us. That's individualized. That's, it's like in any yeah. other family, really, yep. right? There's always, I mean, right? Every family but has I, that. You know, but you, 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 know, you get Starks people, and Houston, you, you, Larry Johnson. I, I, I challenge you right now. You talk to other players, former players, about the work they're doing in terms of alumni and doing work with the, their former teams. They do about one or two events a year, if that. Not much. And the By the way, is, is, the, is, the NBA, is the NBA retired? The NBA retired association. Who's now the president? It seems like they've taken a turn where they're doing more now. It's Scott Rochelle is the new appointed right. uh, president. Now Scott's from in Chicago, right? Yep, or, yeah, Scott's in Chicago. So he's making some stuff happen. Yeah, and he was there already. And who's the player guy? Great now? guy. He's taking over on the player end. Do you know? Or I'm not sure, but I know Scott Rochelle is a new president. He's been doing a fantastic job. He's a great guy. He's, he keeps yeah. you fully informed of everything that's yeah, going he's on. Yeah, he's been like a, you get, He's probably been one of the best. I probably get four or five emails yeah. almost daily as to what's going on with the retired players, what's new, what can you get involved with. And it's, he's always not just sending you, you know, uh, networking opportunities, but he sends you paid opportunities. You know, so it's a, it's a great thing to be a part of. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of the – uh, platinum members, uh, you know, paid all my dues, and so I'm a platinum member, so I get a couple of perks, and it's a beautiful thing uh, to be a part of the NBA and that that whole family. They take care of you, um, you know, unlike any other sport. I feel like I got to ask you this, like LeBron, have you seen a turnaround on a player like this that has now become? He really gets it. He has really taken on who he is. I love the respect he gives to some of the older players. Are you with me on that, or or Le- it seems like he, he's just gotten more? Le- LeBron is heading sh- head and shoulders above 
basically, besides Magic Johnson from a business acumen, from a business standpoint, head and shoulders above anyone that's ever played. I'm not talking about basketball. The things he's done business-wise, the way he set up his friends to work with him, put them in college, the things he's doing off the court, the way he speaks up on political issues, the way he tackles the problems, you know, and let alone the way he, 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 he three years ago he realized he was kind of declining uh, athletically and he wasn't as strong or as fit as he needed to be. So what does he do? He hires a Navy SEAL guy to get him ripped, fit, and ready to – and he's, he's, like, playing younger now, and he's, like – It's unbelievable. So, I mean, his dedication to his craft. I love the props to Russell at the All-Star. I mean, the guy just does so many of the things that are right he's just a good and interesting. He's just become a really good – He's a great Solid guy. citizen. Like, yeah. And, you know, you talk about him 10 years ago, 8 years ago, when he did the move to Miami, and you're wondering. But he was just growing up. It wasn't the move to Miami. Is what he said the after they it. lost – No, as oh, what, what he said after they lost to Miami uh, – after they – lost to Dallas when he said that basically all you prole- proletariats can go back to your jobs and I'll go back to my wonderful life. And it, you don't do that. <laughs> and he lost a lot of people. But he has since all those people who jumped off that bandwagon have since come come back but they realize in the heat of the moment and, you know, your people say things you regret. Did he really mean that? No, but – you, you might say anything after you lose an NBA Finals game. It's painful. Especially if you didn't play well. Plus, plus there was a lot of pressure and a lot of microscope on him mm-hmm. for making the move that he was really entitled to make. So it kind of just rubbed people, maybe out of jealousy or whatever. Well, well, the one thing but I, what I just I don't I don't have a problem with anybody that slips and falls. It's interesting the way they get back up, and it's not what happens in your life; it's what you do with what happens. I just love what he's done and what's happened with him. And using all the influences, this is my knock on Michael and some of the other players. Like, you don't use your influences to make the world a better place. Oh. Like, why would you not take advantage? And I love the fact that he does. Mike's always been, you know, more selfish in that way. Like, you know, and I can't, you know, he's the greatest player to ever play. He's got the greatest brand that's ever been created. Yep. Um, and we really don't know what he does. So, so he maybe he is doing a lot guess of good. What? I don't know. I've never walked a second yeah. in his shoes. Yeah, yeah. But I know what LeBron is doing and the way he's handling himself and the way he he's doing it much different than Mike. Yeah. He's much – he's out there. Yeah. He's the, he's not scared to, to tackle those issues and talk – and he talks about it readily. So, you know, he he, he – he, he big hats off to LeBron from from that standpoint. He's and we doing, should, we, he's doing as fans, right. we should appreciate that because we don't see that all the time. Yeah, everyone – see, everyone's always caught up in is he better than Mike. He's lost. He's 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 three and five in the finals or whatever. Like <laughs> eight but, finals. But do, do you, but think about how much money he's raised in Akron for those for his school, sending kids to college. I mean, like he, he's he's changing people's lives for the better, and he's changing. And and if you change enough people's lives in the same family, you're changing a generation. That's deep. I think he's the real deal. And that's big. Yeah, yeah, of course he how is. Many, how many people do you run into that you could say is the real deal? One last thing I'm going to say about LeBron. The most profound, uh, befuddling thing I've heard, I heard all last year. I was talking to some of the Chase execs at a big Chase event we had in the city with the, the, the Knicks and the Chase. And they were saying how they were interviewing LeBron talking to him about you know life basketball and all that and he said that you know he makes like 80 to about 80 million or so off the court a year no one in the Cavs locker room asks him about business or tries to get in business deals with him isn't that crazy crazy I'd be picking that guy's brain like I used to pick the guys on the Knicks brains all the time Oakley Herb Williams all the time and the best thing Oakley and those guys told me is let your money accumulate. Don't make any. Don't get involved in any business a year five or six. So I took heed to that. But to sit next to a guy who's just, I don't care what he touches. He can take a strand of your hair. It's unbelievable. Lick it and how sell it pe- on. How about the pizza place? <laughs> the pizza joint. The Blaze. I mean. I went there. It's good pizza. How, how good was it? It's really good. I I've respect taken my your kids there. on pizza. I've taken my kids there. On it's scale really good one pizza. To 10, like. It's a nine. Wow, so strong. Because because you, you it's it's like a customized pizza. It's good sauce. It's healthy. 
It's really, really? good. Yeah. Wow. If it was New York crust all the time, it'd be a 10. You know what's amazing? You know, we like, like the New York crust. I'll I give you another thing. Walt Frazier sitting courtside, one of the greatest defensive mm -hmm. guards of all time. You can make an argument the greatest Nick of all time, maybe him and Ewing, whatever. He, I said to him, well, many times, said, how many players have come over and asked you? And you're courtside. You're watching every game in every Knicks career. And he says, nobody's ever come to him and asked for help. Yeah, now, right. I begged John Starks to go to him and ask for help because nobody had that nice little 10-footer than Clyde. And also, he was a defensive specialist. Clyde and was phenomenal. I always pushed uh, Starks to Earl Monroe, too, because nobody had that little that little spin. Nobody Earl, talks about Earl, Earl Monroe. Earl, Earl had Mon that knack. People got to start talking about Earl Monroe. I mean, you're talking He's about, the original black Jesus. Oh, my God. I mean, <laughs> we spent hours in the schoolyard trying to make you know do that spin move. The spin move? And that little elbow shot. I don't know wherever he ended up. He always ended up on the elbow with a little. He could be anywhere where he was. He bearing that. That was his sweet form. spot. Yeah, sweet that was spot. his sweet spot. Love talking with John. Well, I'll do this again, man. Uh, gonna be interesting. Anytime NBA playoffs. You want me, gonna, man. The playoffs are gonna be hot. Gonna I be can't good. wait for the playoffs this year. Uh, it's gonna be interesting. You know, everyone's. I think Houston's gonna do it. Um, yeah, I hope though, so. You know, I, not sure what's gonna happen with Steph Curry. Or, you know, yeah. in the West, Kyrie. I just heard he's out for the. Playoffs and the rest of the season, right? Did you oh, hear that? I didn't hear that. Yeah. Wow. Kyrie's out for the – James Harden, it's his time. Good. Player. He's definitely an MVP this year. He's I'd like to a, borrow his game for one day. James Harden. Can you imagine if you had James Harden's game for the day? Like, if I got the genie bottle, I well, would I would say, I want James Harden's game for the day. I'd go right to Manhattan. Maybe that's why I'm not, a, a, I'm not an NBA GM because I didn't think James Harden was going to be a great NBA player because when I – when I his last game in college was against us, Syracuse, and down in Miami, he had like four points. You're kidding! His last game in college, Arizona State, we played in Miami. I was at the game, 2009. Wow, I didn't even know that. Yeah, and uh, he didn't play that well. He, he looked like flummoxed against the the two three, and obviously he's blossomed into this <sighs> phenomenal wow. player. And Easy. he's you know he's he. But what what James Harden really did last this past summer. Last summer, he got in phenomenal shape because that's what it's about. Kobe and those guys, you you have to get in the type of shape. In the NBA, it's called like optimum shape. You got to get in that kind of shape that you can just run all day. You can get a second, third, fourth win. I miss being in that kind of shape. But that's the kind of shape Harden got in because now he's actually committed on the defensive end. He has more energy at the end of games because what happened to him last year? He ran out of energy. Like he just that, that he he played that bad that last game because he didn't have no energy. When your legs go, you're done. You're done. You're done. Remember, and I'm gonna put Steiner on Harden's level for a second. <laughs> but at the fantasy camp, Steiner ran into a similar problem. Oh. When your work, when your usage rate is at a high rate that you're not normal to, your legs are you're working more than you, you're used to. At the end of those games, you're like, I was done. <laughs> You're done. I was done. You need an ice tub. You need a massage. Yeah. You need oxygen. <laughs> I went to that camp feeling phenomenal, <laughs> feeling like I could score, and I left that camp only half the man I was. <laughs> Sad. We'll but, see you at fantasy camp, by the way. Absolutely. I'm looking forward. He to left it. it all out there, though. That's that's what's important. So I always I always try to. You play left hard. it all out there. You left it all. That's all you I can. I still ask say for. Jerry Mack is still my coach of fantasy camp. He's my Hall of Fame coach, no question. I love that guy. Well, love Jerry's going down this year. I'm not sure if you know that or not. Cause well, if, on he, the, if he drafts me, he's not. I'm on the other side. I'm his good luck charm. Yeah, I'm, I had Son, a I thought you wanted to roll with me. I would like to roll with you, but I won three I won three championships with the man. I mean, I, I got to go, go with the hardware. I have two chips. It's Jerry McNamara. I mean, All right. you, can't, you can't ignore him. Mr. Wallace. Oh, Always good to man. see you, my Thank man. Thank you, my friend. And by the way. Does anybody wear Syracuse stuff better than this man? I don't know. <laughs> Have a great day.